Hello, good morning and good evening. My name is Sawako Hidaka, Executive Director of Asia Society Japan Center. This program is a joint session connecting Asia Society centers in Australia, Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Philippines, India, and Switzerland. Before we get going, some housekeeping. For questions, please type in your questions in chat box or slide out and the moderator will address the questions. As a reminder to all audience, recording is not permitted. Thank you for joining today's program. Survival Society, Pure Invention author, Matt Alt, on how our pandemic lives were made in Japan. I'm so delighted to welcome Matt Alt, the author of Pure Invention, how Japan's pop culture conquered the world and co-founder of Alt Japan based in Tokyo. With more than 20 years experience working alongside Japanese content creators, Matt brings an insider's knowledge of Japan's pop cultural production machine. Forbes magazine recently said, pure invention should be required reading for Japanophiles. Today, he will talk about Japan, Japanese icons from Hello Kitty to Pokemon and Walkman to kar karaoke. He will put context on each of the creations. Even in the pandemic life we live today, he will show us the roadmap of how we got to now. Our moderator, Kenneth Lee, is a Hong Kong-based writer. He created Tales from Tabata, an English blog about contemporary Japanese culture. He also has a Japanese blog called Tabata Book Log, which you could check out all his reading. Kenneth studied international politics and Japanese at Georgetown University and Waseda University. He's a licensed sake sommelier and currently works in legal services. Now over to Matt Alt for his opening remarks. Thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. It is an absolute honor, and I'm very excited to be able to address so many different uh, Asia societies all across the globe. What a time we live in that this is even possible. Um, one of the uh, positive aspects of this whole uh, coronavirus situation is how much more comfortable we've gotten interacting with each other online in situations like this. So over the next uh, 25 minutes or so, I'd like to uh, provide a, a sort of a brief overview of a presentation, a much longer presentation that I usually give that's kind of going to drill down and focus on some of the aspects of my book, which is called Pure Invention, How Japan's Pop Culture Conquered the World. And it came out last spring with seemingly terrible timing amid the coronavirus uh, lockdowns and epidemic. However, it quickly emerged that many of the things that I had left as threads in my book necessarily when I turned it in in uh, late 2019, early 2020, actually were lit fuses leading to some explosive phenomena that nobody could have predicted uh, uh, before they happened. Before we get into that, without any further ado, I'm going to share my screen now and we'll begin the presentation. Let's put that presentation mode. Here we go. We live in very strange times, I think we can all agree. We're more interconnected than ever before, yet seemingly crushingly lonely. We live in a period where the milestones and goalposts of adulthood seem to get continually pushed off to the point where many young adults even refer to their grown-up lives as adulting, as though they're just going through the motions, as though they've lost faith in their ability to even mature and grow up. We're beset by electronic uh, systems that make us simultaneously the center of attention, yet isolate and alienate us at the same time. When things get rough, we escape into virtual constructs to help soothe ourselves and connect with other people in a fantasy environment. Indeed, even the most fundamental aspects of human interaction, simply talking to each other, interacting, have been gamified, 
through the uh, functions of likes, page views, and such. And most recently, we've seen the rise of disturbing cyber religions that have spun off of online communities that are full of rage for the way the system is mistreating them, so they believe, and ex other expressions of rebellion, such as the most recent uh, pushback by members of the bulletin board Reddit against Wall Street, uh, who are buying stock en masse with the explicit intention of tumbling and crushing uh, Wall Street firms, Wall Street investment firms. Now, it would be very tempting to say or believe that all of these things are products of our modern era, they're products of Silicon Valley, they're products of, you know, the, all of the things that we've created uh, up to now. But what if I told you, what if I told you that each one of these phenomena has a very distinctive precursor in Japanese culture, Japanese society, decades before we saw them happening in the West? from the fact that young people uh, in Japan were, uh, starting in the 1990s, had a very difficult time launching their adult uh, careers and even leaving the nest, where adulthood, again, was being reimagined by young people across Japan who felt crushed by their own uh, nation system, where new versions of communication emerged and were forged on the streets of Japan to suit electronic mediums that took off in Japan before they took off uh, in the rest of the world, most famously emoji, which we now use all over the world. And while it's tempting to think of sites such as Instagram uh, as having created uh, influencers who believe they're the center of the world, in fact, the karaoke machine could be called the first user-generated content that made everybody feel like a star, if only for the duration of a song which had profound effects not only on our leisure lives, but on the music industry and even how we lived our lives uh, out on the streets. For instance, how we cocooned ourselves in personal media spheres. Right now, we're all have our faces pressed down into iPhones all the time, but the precursor of all of those electronic devices that we take for granted today is the Sony Walkman, which was invented in 1979 and quickly swept the world with its ability to create a bubble that let us shut out the world around us. So two strange cults emerge in Japan. On the bottom, you can see this comic book style image of the Elm Supreme cult, which in 1995 launched a horrific nerve gas attack against the Japanese subway system. And finally, at bottom right, you can see uh, the mascot character for Two Channel, the world's first widely adopted anonymous bulletin board system, which at first, let Japanese citizens, young citizens, speak truth to power and find their tribes, but quickly emerged as a cesspool of extremism, nationalism, and vulgar behavior. Decades before, similar things emerged in the West. Uh, first, a little bit about my book. The title of it is called Pure Invention, and that's taken from a quote by a man named Oscar Wilde, an Irish playwright, who wrote, in fact, the whole of Japan is a pure invention. There is no such country. There are no such people. The Japanese people are a mode of style, an exquisite fancy of art. Now, when Wilde wrote these words in 1891, he wasn't really talking about Japan at all. He was talking about a trend that was sweeping the Western world called Japanism. Japanism kicked off when American gunboat diplomacy opened Japanese ports to the West in the 1850s and unleashed a flood of Japanese art and craft products on the international market. In these products, which ranged from things like kimono and fans to woodblock prints, Western European tastemakers projected values they thought their own country had lost in the drive toward modernity. Uh, it sparked the entire Impressionist movement. You can see at upper right a self-portrait of Vincent van Gogh, who in placing himself against a backdrop of ukiyo-e prints in his home uh, is presaging modern times when fans of Japanese pop culture plaster their own bedroom walls with anime banners and flags and all sorts of things like that. So in a very real way, Japanese 
tastes came to redefine what it meant to be sophisticated at the turn of the 20th century. Today, this continues in a very real way um, in the fact that we see uh, people all over the world embracing Japanese tastes and values in their fantasies and in their real lives. This is actually a moment from April 2015 when President Barack Obama, welcoming uh, the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe at the White House, said that today was a chance for Americans to say thank you for all the things we love about Japan, like karate and karaoke, manga and anime, and of course, emoji. This was said on the Wall Street, on the, on the White House lawn, and it was a fundamental sea change uh, in the way that the West had seen Japan up until that point. I grew up in an era uh, known as the era of Japan bashing in the 1980s. This was a period after World War II when it was believed that Japan's economic ascendance equaled rivalry to American hegemony, that Japanese products were disrupting Western, not only American, but European markets one after the other, first electronics, then the automotive industries, uh, undermining Western democracies' confidence in themselves to the point where we literally were framing Japanese business as an invasion of our markets. When I was young, it wasn't all uncommon to, to turn on the TV and see images of adults smashing Japanese products or protesting against them in the streets. So too, when we turned to entertainment, were images of an ascendant Japan entirely common. This image at bottom right is from the movie Blade Runner, which is set in Los Angeles of the far-flung year 2019, but it's a Los Angeles that looks a lot more like a Hong Kong or a Tokyo than it does an American city with uh, kanji character signage and giant-sized electronic boards featuring geisha popping pills and selling all sorts of products. Now, while all of this was going on in the adult world around me, uh, it, that wasn't exactly the case with myself. I was a teenager at the time and my young friends. We didn't see Japan as a rival at all. We were surrounded by fantasies from Japan that were not exactly disrupting our fantasy lives because there was nothing on the American market that could compete with these things. First Japanese video games in the form of Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, handheld precursors to the, uh, the portable games we take for granted today, illustrated entertainment in the form of manga, comic books, and cartoons that we tuned into every day as we uh, came home from school, all sorts of complex gadgets and toys that were nothing like the playthings that our Western, uh, uh, Western toy companies had provided for us. And perhaps most importantly, the Nintendo Entertainment System, which arrived in uh, the mid-1980s and provided a delivery device for all sorts of content made in Japan straight to the hearts of uh, Western youth. I grew up, I majored in Japanese in college, and I began working for the US government as a translator. And at the turn of the millennium, I founded, I co-founded my own company with my wife. It's called All Japan Co. Limited. It's a localization company. And we specialize in helping Japanese creators translate their visions and their words into English and other languages so that they can sell their content abroad. And 20 years of experience doing this is, you know, I've, I've had a kind of seat at the table with Japanese creatives and tastemakers, and I've seen the way Japanese fantasies spark into life, how they're marketed, and how they're translated uh, for foreign audiences. Over the years, when I first started doing this, there was often quite a lag between the time that a Japanese uh, show or manga or product came out in Japan and when it was released in the West, sometimes months, sometimes years. And often there were quite a few changes made to those products to make them more palatable, especially to Western audiences. But over the last 10 years or so, I started to notice a trend, which is that the fans of these products were getting increasingly vocal they wanted their Japanese fantasies as quickly as possible, and they wanted them as authentic, as close as possible to the original Japanese. At first, I thought, maybe this is some kind of modern-day Japanism. Maybe these are just obsessed fans. 
But then I realized that wasn't the case because it wasn't just the most vocal fans. It was everybody. There was a great synchronization of Western tastes and Japanese tastes happening. And that's precisely the story that I try to tell in Pure Invention, how Japanese fantasies unwittingly transformed Western dreams and in the process are realities. Because it's very difficult to imagine how we're going to change our realities without fantasies to help us do that. To tell this story, which is actually quite large in scope, I use the lens of hit Japanese products of all sorts. Toys, upper left, you can see the first hit product after World War II in Japan, a tin toy Jeep made out of junk tin that was uh, scavenged from American military bases. I tracked down the very first karaoke machine, which is still owned by the now quite elderly gentleman who made it. I tracked down the first Hello Kitty product, which is this purse, which went on sale in 1974. And from it, an empire flourished of kawaii cuteness and femininity. Of course, you can't forget the first Walkman. The first hit anime intended for adult audiences in the form of Mobile Suit Gundam and other cartoon shows that appealed to demographics that were in the West uh, seen as very cutting edge for illustrated entertainment. Japanese video games, of course, perhaps most importantly, Pokemon, which swept the planet in uh, the late uh, 1990s. The creation of new online vocabularies forged in the crucible of Japanese youth communities on the streets of Tokyo and other big cities, such as Emoji. And uh, perhaps most importantly to our current moment, Anonymous online bulletin board systems. This is a screen capture at bottom right from 2Channel, which is the precursor of a website that we know in the West as 4chan, which led to further developments such as 8chan and 8kun that continue to royal society and politics today. I call the products in Pure Invention fantasy delivery devices. These are products that are more than the sum of their parts. They change the way that we see Japan, and they also changed the way that we lived our lives, and sometimes both at once. To be considered a fantasy delivery device for the purposes of my book, a product had to be inessential. It was something we bought not because we needed it, but because we wanted it. It had to be inescapable. It had to be such a hit that really there was no way to get around it, like, for instance, Pokemon in the late 1990s. It also had to be influential. Like I said before, it had to be something that changed minds, not only changed minds about Japan, but also changed minds about the way we live our lives. I call these uh, criteria the three ins, and they define the products that I use as the lens to explore how Japanese fantasies inflected our own and changed our realities. Now, normally I would go through a very long, uh, hour long, uh, discussion of uh, all of the different products in the book. But because we don't have a whole lot of time, I'm going to jump ahead to a period of time right after the, whoops, do you know what? I'm sorry. We're going to have to hold on one second here because I realized, I think that I am using an old version of this presentation. Please bear with me for just one second. I'm going to reopen that. While I'm reopening it, let me explain a little bit about uh, Japanese post-war history that's kind of key to this. After World War II, Japan went through a period called its high growth phase. And that's the time that led to the Japan bashing I talked about of the 1980s. Japan bashing during that period, it seemed like Japan was quite literally going to take over the world. Uh, people were worried that we would be Japanized in a bad way, that we'd all be working for Japanese uh, bosses and that Japanese people would be calling all of the shots. However, things didn't exactly play out that way. In 1990, let me get my screen sharing going on here. Share this. Here we go. In 1990, the Japanese stock market experienced a terrible crash. And this 
was the end of what was known as the Japanese economic bubble in 1990. You can see this crash here on the asset prices chart at the left. And this led to an entrenched period of recession, a what you could call a failure of the Japan dream, and a whole host of social problems. Looking back, economists now call this period the lost decades, which and they lasted from 1990 to 2010. In many ways, they're a harbinger. They presage our own great recession uh, that happened in 2008 with the Lehman shock. Then that continues today. We're kind of experiencing our own lost decades in America and uh, Europe right now. Japan had very much a head start on us by having its own economy grind to a halt in 1990. When this happened, suddenly Japan was not in the headlines anymore. It was written off as irrelevant. The Japanese experiment had failed. And at that point, American uh, tech industries were taking off and the lens quickly shifted to them. A whole host of problems began to occur in Japanese society in the 1990s around this time. A plunging fertility rate, known as a hyper-aging society, uh, by 2010, literally more adult diapers were being sold than baby diapers. In the 1990s, we saw in Japan the employment ice age, which was a period of time when even uh, graduates of good schools, uh, good colleges and universities in Japan, top ones, had a hard time getting a job if they could get one at all. And the rise of the freeder economy. Freeders are what we now we know in English as temps. It was kind of the gig, the beginning of the, what we now know as the gig economy in the 1990s in Japan. We saw the rise of cults, such as Alma Supreme, who I mentioned before. We saw political dysfunction with 14 prime ministers coming and going in just that 20 year period between 1990 and 2010, with none really being able to articulate any kind of vision for their country, let alone for young people who were suffering arguably the most. Uh, media pundits coined all sorts of new terms, such as parasite singles, young adults unable to leave the nest, compensated dating, which are Japanese schoolgirls who were selling their time and sometimes their bodies to older men in exchange for uh, designer clothes and handbags and things like that. The word hikikomori, which is now pretty well known around the world, uh, was coined in the 1990s to refer to people who refused to leave their bedrooms at all recluses who stayed locked in their homes. And also the word otaku was a buzzword. It referred to grown-ups who were dropping out of society and hyper-consuming kid stuff, refusing to grow up, a sort of kidult a decade or so before that term took off in the West. One of the key vectors for Japanese uh, fantasies into the Western world, and we'll see why this is important here in a moment, was the family computer in 1982. It was known as the, whoops, went ahead there. Whoa, going a little ahead of myself here. Let's reshare that. Sorry about this. That is odd. I'm having a hard time controlling this. Let me see what I can do here. Apologies for this, people. I promise I'll get it right this time. Very odd. Well, I can't control this. Simultaneously with Japan being written off in the uh, mainstream Western press was by not only because of its economic crash, but because of all of these social problems it was experiencing was an interesting phenomenon at work. Japanese fantasies were, if anything, increasing in their power and their ability to uh, reach out to the outside world. By 1993, 80% of the entire game market was owned by Nintendo, a Japanese company. In fact, Nintendo uh, had a uh, NES device in one out of every three U.S. homes. Nintendo sales alone equal 10% of the U.S.-Japan trade deficit. And perhaps most disturbingly to Americans, more American children in a 1993 survey recognized Mario than they did Mickey. So much for Japan being irrelevant. In fact, Japan's epic crash arguably made it even more relevant because while we weren't necessarily buying Japan's physical products, we were consuming its fantasies in increasing ways. 
And so too was Japan's experiences on the street in Japan. So too were they, without anybody realizing it quite yet, presaging trends that would be happening abroad. For instance, let's look at the mid-1990s when the Japanese schoolgirl emerged as an unlikely tastemaker in Japanese society. It was Japanese schoolgirls who transformed pagers that were initially intended for salary men, doctors, lawyers, into rudimentary texting devices. It was Japanese schoolgirls who also transformed another device that was intended for salary men, a photo booth called Print Club that was originally meant for salary men to take photos of themselves to glue onto their business cards and turn it into a selfie machine that they would go to and accumulate literal Facebooks of stickers of their friends. It was Japanese schoolgirls who pioneered the use of emoji, which were originally included in Japanese cell phones as a graphical element to allow websites to load faster when uh, uh, internet speeds were a lot slower than they are today. And they used them not as graphic elements. They started incorporating them to their texts as a new form of digital communication. Japanese schoolgirls were among the first adopters of what was then in 1999, the world's first truly popular uh, mobile internet service, iMode. And uh, so too did they disrupt the entire karaoke industry as a new streaming karaoke system emerged in the mid 1990s to cater directly to their tastes transforming Japanese karaoke from a old guy pastime into a young girl pastime virtually overnight. And so too, the Japanese pop industry, which until that point had been dominated by Enka ballads for old people and suddenly was now being overtaken by idol singers of the sort that we see today. All of these trends were due to the Japanese schoolgirls who transformed all of these products that were originally intended for adults into a new form of communication for themselves suited for the digital era that they found themselves adrift in. So too in 1995, did we see the emergence of the first truly popular anime that was watched by adults and not only watched by adults, but actually incorporated into their identities as viewers saw in the travails of the hero Shinji, their own struggles in Japanese society, uh, downtrodden by adults and authority figures and unable to make decisions or advance for themselves. And of course, we can't uh, forget Pokemon, which was perhaps the largest Japanese fantasy to take off uh, in the 1990s. It was initially intended for a Game Boy system that was on its last legs. It was about to be retired, but it transformed the meaning of, uh, of online, of portable video gaming and became a literal phenomenon around the planet to the point where even gatekeepers like the New Yorker couldn't uh, avoid commenting on Pikachu's strange cultural gravity that seemed to be sucking in the entire world with this made in Japan fantasy. It was around 2001 when a science fiction writer by the name of William Gibson said, the Japanese seem to the rest of us to live several measurable clicks down the timeline. If you believe that all cultural change is essentially technologically driven, you pay attention to the Japanese. Gibson was talking about uh, things like high-tech services, like the emoji, like the iMode internet service on cell phones, which still hadn't percolated into the Western world. But he was also right in a variety of other ways such as those aforementioned problems I talked about with the aging society, which now societies around the globe are grappling with, such as the youth problems when the dream of your nation collapses and young people are left to fend for themselves in an, new, an online world without any sort of adult role models or oversight. It's around this time as well that Japanese fantasies begin to get rewarded uh, Hayao Miyazaki wins a Oscar for his film Spirited Away, which is an unrepentantly Japanese movie made for Japanese audiences, very difficult to parse for Western uh, viewers, but it nevertheless won an Oscar and which also kicked off a whole trend in anime and Japan influenced entertainment, ranging from the Wachowski siblings and uh, anime inspired Animatrix to Quentin Tarantino's incorporation of anime scenes into his Hollywood hit Kill Bill Volume 1. 
it seems like it was a big coming out for Japanese pop culture. Even seemingly obscure sorts of Japanese products, such as kawaii, Japanese cuteness, were being incorporated by Japanese tastemakers, excuse me, by American tastemakers, rock stars, such as Lisa Loeb up here on the left, who did an entire uh, hit album dedicated to Hello Kitty. And uh, people like Lady Gaga, who are dressing up, as you can see here, in Kitty-inspired anime drag. But perhaps most relevant to our times is the 1990 emergence of the website 2Channel, which is a totally anonymous internet message board. Now we take this sort of thing for granted, but when this occurred in Japan, there was nothing like it abroad, and it had profound impacts on Japanese society. It allowed people, young people who felt alienated by their society to connect with one another, which is great because you could find your tribe. But it also promoted, because there was absolutely no uh, uh, responsibility for anything anyone said, everything was anonymous, it promoted increasingly aggressive and even obnoxious forms of online behavior, ranging from trolling to nationalism, and then the foundation of what is now known in Japan as the net right, a group of extremely vocal, extremely nationalistic and racist posters on the group who did everything they could to try to topple what they saw as left-leaning liberal society with its progressive, uh, with progressive attitudes that they felt uh, were stripping them of their ability to flourish in society. Uh, Two-channel led directly to 4chan, which was patterned off of a two-channel uh, offshoot site. And you can see 4chan here, uh, has, if you look at its boards, most of them are devoted to Japanese themes, anime and manga, cute, mecha, cosplay, things like that, video games. 4chan too began as a sort of utopian experiment where people could find uh, like-minded individuals who are mainly into Japanese things. Uh, and in fact, it flourished thanks to its close interaction with anime conventions, uh, most namely Otakon, which is a big anime convention on the East Coast, and regular 4chan panels onboarded even more uh, Japanese sensibilities into the online mainstream. By 2016, 4chan had its own vocal right-wing uh, alt-right groups, who were engaging in political theater online and spreading conspiracy theories that would turn out to have some sorts of profound impacts, not only online, but on real life politics as well. In 2016, a, a conspiracy theory called Pizzagate, which promulgated that Hillary Clinton was the head of a pedophile Satanistic sex ring that was planning to enslave the planet, took off on 4chan and made the transition into mainstream media in America. Uh, arguably, it played a role in her losing the 2016 elections because 4chan's uh, alt-right posters threw themselves behind Trump using a bizarre synthesis of anime and politics to make memes that they spread throughout the internet. This grew to be such an issue that at one point during the campaign, a GOP strategist called Trump supporters childless single men who masturbate to anime, which was really a kind of shocking moment just to see this on mainstream TV, for one thing, and for another, to see how Japanese fantasies had so inflected uh, American youth, particularly online, that it was actually beginning to transform American politics. This is true on the other side as well. After Trump got elected, there was a march, a women's march in Washington, D.C., and its participants donned these hats called pussy hats. I invented Chris, I, I yeah, interviewed Krista Suh, who is the co-creator of these hats, and she told me that she was directly inspired by Sanrio and Hello Kitty when she created them. So you can see that this, uh, these, the, the, infiltration, the percolation of Japanese sensibilities into uh, American society was not limited to the any one political party or any one group. It was culture writ large. We can also see this same sort of thing happening around the world, such as in the use of anime imagery for the Thai democracy protests and also uh, some uh, incorporated into the Hong Kong uh, democracy protests of last year. And most recently, we've seen this uh, infusion uh, of Japanese sensibilities in the form of Animal Crossing, New Horizons, which uh, has sold, which debuted right in the middle of lockdowns last year, seemingly terrible timing, 
but went on to sell 11 million units in one month alone in March, and then 31 million by the end of the year. It was a, a virtual sort of fantasy where people could make their own island and kind of enjoy it while they were locked down uh, in their own homes, kind of we were all transformed into virtual hikikomori by the uh, COVID lockdowns of last year and continuing today. So too are we seeing strange movements that evoke uh, the cults that Japan struggled with in the 1990s, most uh, specifically QAnon movement. QAnon emerged on 4chan, it is a mutation of the Pizzagate conspiracy theory. And it led to, most famously, the uh, attack on the Capitol in uh, January, the U.S. Capitol in January of 2020. And in the final closing here, this is an image that was taken on the floor of the Capitol during the siege. And it shows a gentleman who is arguably dressed in a cosplay that is inspired by uh, uh, Western video games, uh, military video games. But perhaps most importantly is the person standing behind this gentleman. It's his mother. It turns out that many of the people who participated in the siege on the Capitol were either driven to or, or facilitated by their parents. Many of them lived at home with their parents in a very startling and evocative connection back to those lost decades of Japan when parasite singles emerged who couldn't leave their own homes. It's just another example of how Japanese style trends have come to be our trends in this modern, interconnected, politically tumultuous era that we find ourselves living in. Now, I think I've gone significantly over the 25 minutes <laughs> that I was supposed to have. Apologies for that. But uh, that's it for my presentation. Uh, Kenneth, you want to you wanna take, the, take the mic? Uh, sure. Thank you, Matt, uh, for Thank your you. amazing insights and for your powerful discussion on the intersection between politics and Japanese pop culture. And uh, once again, thank you to Asia Society, all the centers around the world for having me. Uh, again, my name is Kenneth, and I will be relaying your questions to Matt in just a few moments. Uh, please identify yourself if you can, and leave a comment on the Slido or in the Zoom box, the YouTube chat box, and I'll read the question to Matt. Um, so maybe we can kick off with some of my own questions. Um, so, as you alluded to in your presentation, a central part of your book is that in Japan before and in the United States now, a lot of young people feel abandoned, uh, who feel that their lives are adrift, um, engage in an invention or reinvention of consumer products uh, with far-reaching societal consequences. But to me, schoolgirls who become power users of pagers seem quite different from Proud Boys organizing on social media or Reddit investors repurposing, say, Robinhood to have a go against Wall Street hedge funds. Um, to what extent are these parallel developments in these countries a reflection of internet human behavior, of things that have gone wrong in our current societal structures rather than a Japanization of American tastes? It's true. Japanization is actually a very loaded word because it implies a sort of active uh, motive in, in, in trying to take over uh, something else. That isn't the case at all here. What we're seeing is time and time again that trends that occurred in Japan and were treated by the Western media as strange have in fact turned out not to be strange at all. They are not bugs, but features of late capitalist post-manufacturing societies that are in trouble, if not necessarily decline. What we can see from the schoolgirls repurposing pagers is young people using tools that were intended for other purposes to make their own lives easier to live uh, in, a, in a situation where they don't get much guidance from above. They don't see much of a track for improving themselves or their careers. Uh, and so what they do is they throw themselves wholeheartedly into communication. Now, I don't think it, it's, anybody can make a case to support the Proud Boys, but one thing that they are doing that's similar to what everybody around the world is doing is connecting with each other on these uh, digital media of online anonymous websites. Uh, you know, arguably, that's what spawned them. Uh, I think if you hadn't had an anonymous uh, image board like 4chan, it would have been a lot more difficult for those people to find each other or to realize how many of them there were. So 
you know, nobody's making the argument that schoolgirls using pagers led to racist, you know, movements in the West or anything like that. Those schoolgirls were not trying to overturn the world order, but they did simply through the sheer number of them making their consumer choices by all of them going out en masse to buy a pager. Suddenly a pager became for girls, not for adults. And we see that same thing with the Reddit group, uh, the Wall Street Bets group, en masse using these tools that were meant just for people to invest and build up their retirement accounts, transforming them into financial weapons uh, that they weren't intended to be. That much is very similar. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that sort of thing in the years to come. Yes. Yeah, I think so too. Actually, that leads on to my next question, which is sure. that the net right is still uh, very much alive um, on Japanese Twitter today on yes. and on other social media sites. And I don't anticipate the American version to lose its relevance anytime soon. Um, what insights do you think Japan can give to the world uh, in how to deal with these communities that only exist in the virtual sphere? Well, I think it's one of the key things to remember here. One of the key differences between Japan and America is that it's net right has never made the transition into mainstream media or politics in the way that the alt-right did in America. There's a variety of reasons for that, one of which is that the media ecosystem here in Japan is fundamentally different from that of America. In Japan, there's a fairness doctrine, uh, which precludes the rise of partisan media. In America, we have things like talk radio, uh, we have partisan uh, news outlets like Fox and Newsmax. Those don't exist here. Neither does a 24-7 news cycle, which is with its constant hunger for new scoops, no matter how small they are. And also Japanese uh, mass media, Japanese mass media gatekeepers are traditionally hugely reluctant to rely on any kind of online sourcing. So it's very difficult to wash uh, uh, conspiracy theories or fringe politics into the mainstream in the way that you can in the West, where, for instance, uh, Fox News will report on something that they saw on YouTube. When it blows up online, then other news outlets leap in and suddenly some tiny fringe belief or some fringe happening has become mainstream news. It's very difficult for that to happen here. And that's one of the big reasons that we haven't seen QAnon rise here. Uh, even though Japan had an alt-right before America, even though Japan has had apocalyptic cults, even though Japan has had a long history of conspiracy theories, some of them quite violent, uh, such as the anti-Korean conspiracy theories of the 1923 earthquake period. And also after Fukushima, we saw similar from the alt-right anti-Korean and Chinese uh, rhetoric and conspiracies trying to spread online, but fortunately were contained by this uh, Japanese ecosystem that differs from our own. So there's that kind of barrier here. And I think it has kept some of the more uh, extreme elements from inflecting society in the way that they have in the West. Great. Um, we'll get into some audience questions in just a moment, but I guess turning on to the more pulp culture aspects. So a recurring theme in your book is the organic quality of the entrepreneurship that kind of gives rise to the fantasy delivery devices. Uh, you talk about how an NBC employee came across Astro Boy just by accident yes, you saw in, his, <laughs> in a you Tokyo saw hotel. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we see that Japan is trying to capitalize on this global interest through things like the Cool Japan campaigns or anime tourism initiatives. Um, and Mr. Abe himself appeared in Rio in a Mario yeah. hat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Talk about a moment in geopolitics. Yeah. So how would you evaluate these more official or more corporate initiatives? So th this is the really interesting thing. The Japanese cool, J the, the Japanese government's cool Japan program is a completely separate thing from actual cool content being produced in Japan. In fact, it's in many ways, the antithesis of cool. Like, you know, is there anything less cool than the authorities telling you what's cool, but putting aside the efficacy of the cool Japan program, one of the lessons I learned from investigating and writing Pure Invention was how little the, these Japanese tastemakers considered foreign markets when they were making these products. They made them for Japanese people first and foremost, and outside markets were secondary. If they sold well abroad, great. 
And certain companies were well uh, poised to take advantage of that, such as Sony and Nintendo, which already had foreign offices and a certain amount of expertise in exporting uh, products abroad. Others were not so, like the inventors of the karaoke machines never, ever imagined exporting those abroad. They were only exported abroad much later by big electronics companies who had kind of uh, taken them over. Uh, similar for the Japanese toys, similar for Hello Kitty. I mean, Sanrio did open a variety of uh, Sanrio stores abroad in the 1980s, but it's taking off among adults with something purely organic, not planned by, uh, by Sanrio, and only exploited really to a limited amount in the early years by Sanrio until they realized that actually the real audience abroad wasn't schoolgirls. It was tastemakers like Lady Gaga and like becoming a lifestyle product. So, you know, it's the, 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 the more that a product actually became a lifestyle product, the more it's likely to have been a fantasy delivery device in the first place. So there's a kind of a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's that aspect of it as well. But um, I forget where we're going with this, but uh, yes. Great. Um, so let's turn to some audience questions. Uh, a lot of consumers of Japanese media in the West are fringe groups, e.g. weebs. Has this limited social acceptability of Japanese media, uh, this limited social acceptability of Japanese media had an effect on the construction of our image of Japan? Are they all weebs? Last time I checked, Marie Kondo's books were selling in the millions and people were tuning into Netflix to see this Japanese woman help them through the uh, decluttering of their modern lives. Uh, you know, anime, manga, uh, they tend to attract more of an outsider groups who see in them an alternative to their own nation's uh, uh, mass media, to their own nation's cool factor. And, you know, that, that's absolutely the case. But so too have, since our societies have come to resemble each other in so many ways, again and again, we see products that were made for Japanese audiences taking off abroad because they fit a need that we didn't even know we had until we saw them. Marie Kondo is an example of that. Uh, another example of that is the uh, Haruki Murakami books. Haruki Murakami, is he is writing arguably in a Western idiom, but he's writing for Japanese audiences. Uh, he definitely is not writing for Western ones. You can see from the titles of his book, like IQ84 and Colorless Tsuru Tazaki, these aren't titles or names or words that come easily to Westerners, but we consume him nonetheless because his disaffected urban protagonists mirror how we see ourselves in, in urban society. So, you know, it's, it's not correct, I think, to chalk up Japan's soft power successes abroad to simply nerd uh, or geek culture, even though that is a, a huge aspect of, of what makes the Japanese uh, uh, pop cultural engine turn. Uh, but, you know, Hollywood movies like the Transformers, I mean, these aren't just being sold to, you know, people who live in a room full of anime posters. They're being sold to all Americans and Chinese and people all over the world. So I, I think that's really important to keep in mind when you think about the reach of Japanese fantasies. It's not just limited to kids. It's not just limited to fringe groups. Great. Um, so another question, this one is from Martin. Uh, your book is titled how Japan's pop culture conquered the world, yet every single reference you make seems strictly American. Could you please comment on this? Of course, I understand the US is a cultural hegemon, but it seems rel a relatively narrow view on a very grand thesis statement. First of all, many, many apologies for having to deliver a truncated, a very truncated 25-minute uh, presentation. Uh, and also apologies, yes, I'm an American, and so there is an American focus to the book. However, there are also many examples in the text that deal with countries other than America. One of my most favorite deals with a company called Matsui. That was a hit electronics product, a uh, hit electronics company in England in the 1980s, until it became revealed that Matsui, with its uh, Rising Sun logo, was actually the invention of a local UK firm called Curry's that was using it to make its product seem Japanese 
uh, and give them a little bit of cachet that they didn't have. And they were actually caught and fined for doing this. But it was an interesting eddy in the flow of globalization that you had uh, a Western nation pretending to be Japanese to get its products uh, into the uh, its own marketplace. Uh, there are so many examples of the percolation of Japanese products through foreign marketplaces, the uh, percolation of, of karaoke through like the Philippines is a good example. And I know that there is a gentleman in the Philippines who claims to have a stake in having invented it domestically there. But the karaoke phenomenon, I think, is practiced more than the machine is what the Japanese fantasy is that's being delivered out to the world. The fact that you are the star for the duration of a song. And, you know, we see the impact of that in all sorts of things like the Eurovision Song Contest. I mean, karaoke is popular all over the world. It's arguably less popular in America than it is in England, uh, in Europe, and in the Far East. And uh, there are just so many examples of that. And I just couldn't get to them today. I wish I could I could go into them more. Um, but yeah, the, the Japanization of fantasies is a global phenomenon. It is, it, obviously it's localized into certain places. Not every country is going to be experiencing it in the same way. Um, but it is absolutely a fact. And I think we're seeing it in the way that so many Japanese products are being consumed all around the world. Uh, not simply because they're well-made, but because they come from a place that resembles where we see ourselves be, they, they came, they were made in a place that got to the future a little bit ahead of the rest of us. Great. Um, another question from the audience. You have commented that Japan possesses cultural traits which make it adept at conjuring up characters or at least seeing them where others might not. How does Japan compare to its East Asian neighbors, Korea and China, in this, as in this aspect? That's actually a good question. Uh, I can only speak for my research into Japan because I have not uh, deeply researched Korea and China. And China is has a long and rich tradition, so does Korea, of creating hit content. I mean, you know, there's the Song Goku and the the uh, uh, water margin. There's so many classical Chinese texts that influenced not only locally in, in terms of Asia, but around the world. So this isn't a race. Um, it's not a zero sum game when a Japanese character wins, uh, you know, it becomes a hit. It doesn't mean that a Chinese one's being excluded when parasite wins at the box office. It doesn't mean that a Japanese or a Chinese film is, is not going to win at, at the box office. So that's important to keep in mind, but Japan has a unique ability to create characters. I believe because Japan has a long tradition of animism and polytheism and in those beliefs, uh, which, hold that a spirit can dwell in almost anything, you know, ranging from the terrain to a word. Uh, it's easy to imagine presences in the world all around you. And some of Japan's earliest exports in ukiyo-e prints and things were Japanese folklore dealing with anthropomorphic characters. Characters like uh, not only monsters, but things like ninja. Ninja emerged in, in, in Japanese pop culture in the, in the early 1800s and had become the textbook definition of a sneaky person or sneaky behavior around the world. China had plenty of assassins, I'm sure. Korea, the, you know, the term assassin comes from the Middle East. America certainly has plenty of assassins. So why have, why have the ninja become the poster child? The Japanese ninja become the poster child for this. That's a testament to Japan's uh, ability to create compelling narratives and visuals. The, the visual of the ninja as we know it was created by Hokusai, the same gentleman who came up with the wave over Kanagawa. So we have a lot of craftsmanship going into both the visual and the narrative storytelling here. And I think that is the bedrock of why Japan again and again is able to create these characters that uh, not only become hits in their own country, but around the world. Yeah, I think, thank you. I think that's also really a fascinating area to look into in the future, because I think in Hong Kong at the anime and game conventions, we see a lot of, um, a lot of merging of these visuals from a lot of Chinese companies who are creating mobile games, but have kind of anime art styles too. Very fascinating. Um, a question now from Caitlin. May I ask if you could share anything about the rise of gachapon machines and adults collecting miniature models and toys? 
<laughs> wow, that's a pinpoint question. It's a great <laughs> one too. God, I love Gashapon machines. Actually, though, Japan has a long tradition of little figurines going way back to the uh, 19th to 18th century. Uh, there was a uh, a type of ornament uh, used on the kimono called the netsuke. And it was a toggle. It was like a little toggle attached to a string that would let you hang uh, the equivalent of a, a wallet, a purse, or maybe a tobacco pouch on the obi of your kimono because kimono didn't have pockets. And over the years, these changed from just simple little balls or you know pieces of whatever into intricately sculpted uh, little figurines. And if you look up Netsuke, N-E-T-S-U-K-E online, you'll see all sorts of examples of people from, from the 1800s and before of these kind of playful uh, figurines based on all sorts of things from not only real life, like cats and dogs or like samurai or like frogs, but also imaginary creatures, yokai monsters, oni demons, uh, all sorts of wild and imaginative things. So there's this long tradition of sculpting small things that appeal in a playful way to adults. And Gachapon, I think, really hit a, a kind of sweet spot for Japanese designers who I think thrive when they have uh, a certain amount of restrictions around them. You know, everything from haiku, which could be called a kind of constrained poem into that 575 uh, meter to uh, the, the smash hit video games of the 1980s, which had a very limited palette and a very limited amount of ability to display. But yet Japanese designers were able to make these really compelling characters like Pac-Man or Dig Dug or Donkey Kong. It's that same sort of process, I think, that you uh, see at work in the gachapon. And, you know, Japan loves its vending machines. So why not vend uh, little toys as well as drinks and all sorts of other things? This is my own follow-up question. What's the most interesting gachapon you've seen in Tokyo? Actually, you know, I was just recently <laughs> tweeting about this. I found this series of gachapon of external air conditioning units like the ones that you see on the outside of buildings. And like, there was a whole series of them. And like, there's there's literally a gachapon for everything, uh, everything. I've seen like gachapon for like construction workers' helmets. I've seen them for, uh, uh, you know, things things like cans of paint, you know. There's even gachapon of gachapon machines all fit into that little capsule. How meta is that? So that kind of playfulness, I think, is one of the engines of Japan's creative culture. And it, it fuels everything from manga and anime to the idea of let's take a big stereo system and, and, and make it small so you can carry it around with headphones, which is how we got the Walkman. That's a very playful way of, of making a piece of electronics. And I think very li linked to all of that, let's work around the limitations and see what we can do within that. Great. Uh, so I'll hand it over. Uh, thank you so much, Matt, for um, asking the audience questions. Um, I think yeah. we'll hand it over now to uh, Joy, who will end our talk. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kenneth and Matt. Uh, I think there's a couple of more questions, but perhaps sure. we can send it over to you, Matt. Absolutely. Um, Everybody feel free to get in touch with me anytime. I'm happy to answer these over email or whatever. Yeah, and, and maybe later you can also tell us where we can buy your book. That's a smart idea, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So thank you again to you and, and Kenneth for the discussions today, and um, especially on your fascinating take on Japanisms and, and more. So we're very appreciative of, of our um, Japanese uh, Japan Center, led by Sawako, for bringing all the Asia Society Centers together for this talk. And uh, I think we refer to them as Japanese pop culture, but the reality is things like manga, anime, gaming, technology, um, etc., have really created um, a global language, don't you think? And uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and it allows all of us to converse better, especially our young people across Asia and the world. So with that, Matt, thank you again. Good evening. And let us all continue to stay safe and healthy. Um, over thank to you, you so for, much. Your last minute. Um,
reminders or where to buy your book. Yes, thank you. Well, Pure Invention, uh, uh, How Japan's Pop Culture Conquered the World is available at any bookstore, uh, your favorite bookstore, okay. support your local bookstore. If it's not in stock, it can be ordered. It is a mainstream release uh, from Crown Publishing in the United States. Uh, and it's also, there's a UK edition available as well. You can see the different covers behind me. Um, but by all means, uh, look forward to your local bookstore. And thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Over to you, Sawako. Oh, Sawako, where are oh, you? I think, I think that's that's it for, for today. So <laughs> okay. on behalf of Asia Society uh, and all the other centers, thank you again and have a good evening. You too. Thanks to everybody for coming.